I think it's a little obvious that in the psalm, one of the things we are to be thankful for is the Lord's steadfast love. When we think about this call for us to be thankful, as the psalm begins with a command to give thanks, we may wonder, what does it mean to give thanks to the Lord? Is this the Lord telling us that in terms of being thankful to him, he's just commanding us? Now, God could certainly do that. He is God. We are his creatures, and we are called to be thankful to God, whether we've been redeemed or not. He is God. We are the creatures. He is a king. Uh, we are the subjects, whether we own it or not. But the psalm is not just merely commanding us to be thankful. It is commanding us to be thankful, but it gives us a lot of reason to be thankful, and it's not a thankfulness for ourselves and who we are, but it's a thankfulness for God and who he is. And so when we say this, we don't want to just say be thankful, but why should we fundamentally be, be thankful? Why, why should we be thankful for this language of the Lord's steadfast love? What does that fundamentally mean? Well, what is that fundamentally proving? So as we consider this, we'll be thankful to God or for God overall, thankful for God's redemption, thankful for God's continual care, and thankful in all or in all things. And so let's begin then where we're thankful uh, for God being the ruler over all. Basically, you look at verses uh, 1 through 9 in terms of the psalm, and you notice what God has done. That at the beginning of this psalm, and, and as I noted in the introduction, it's not optional to be thankful to God. It begins with, give thanks to the Lord. This is a command. We are to be thankful to God. Uh, this is a call for us to truly look upon the Lord, be thankful for who he is, to recognize he is a God who manifests his goodness. That's fundamentally what it's saying, that the Lord shows his goodness and manifests his goodness. We may say then, what, what is the manifestation of this goodness? How, how do we see and know that God is good? Now again, as God reveals himself and says he is good, that is sufficient. But that's not all that the psalm is laying out for us. Because notice that as we have this command to give thanks to God, and we have this reminder that he is good, that is the reason, give thanks to God, here's the command, the reason for that is because God is good. And we say, well, how do we know God is good? Well, it says his steadfast love endures forever. Now, when you hear that, you say, what a wonderful thing. This means that God's love never changes, it never wavers, it is consistent throughout all time. In fact, as you notice in the psalm, one of the ways I thought about doing this was just having the congregation repeat, for his steadfast love endures forever, because you notice that's in every verse in the psalm, which I think it's safe to say that's probably a theme that the psalmist is trying to communicate to us that we would understand this repetition that there is a steadfast love of God. And so where does this steadfast love manifest itself? Well, first of all, he's telling us that God rules over all things. When he says the God of gods and the Lord of lords, we may say, why the God of gods? The temptation is to think that maybe other gods are legitimate, right? So you can have God being the supreme God, and then there's lesser gods that he sort of commands and rules over. Now, in a sense, you can see in Psalm 82, when he calls the Elohims to himself, uh, one could try and make that case, but the Elohims are really the rulers of the earth and also the angels of heaven. These are not gods that the Lord is, is competing with by any means. It's actually the Lord is a supreme God. He is a supreme ruler. This is what it wants us to understand. In our minds, we can come up with other gods. We can uh, think of other gods. And there's those who may think of themselves as being gods. But the psalmist is saying, but they're not really gods that compete. They're not gods who will rise up over him. And so if there's other beings that in our minds, we may think, you know, like for Israel, I think the Baals. Better be careful of the Baals. Don't want to tick off Baal, right? You think about the other gods of the other nations. We can have our gods in our own minds. The psalmist is saying, understand this is the God who truly is God and manifests himself. But then there's the other declaration of the Lord of Lords. When you think of Lords, 
This is more, you think of like a, a king or someone who may rule over an empire. And so the Lord is, is giving us the assurance that no matter how big or boastful these kings may get, or how significant they may be in their own mind or understanding, they will not rise above the true God. Whatever gods they think they can harness on their side, they will not rise up above the true God. And so the first thing the psalmist wants us to understand is that we're thankful to God because he's a God of gods and he's the Lord of lords. But there's a reason for this. You see, one of the theories that people can have in terms of creation, and there's different stories that went around, there's a variety of gods, and there were wars that broke out, and so the creation is created uh, from the remains of those different gods. Well, the psalmist wants to dispel that, because people would read this and say, oh, well, there's other gods that were involved in the creation. They're saying, no. There's one God who rules over all gods. There's no God that really competes with him. Any rulers on this earth that may think they're a God, they're nothing in comparison to the Lord. And he's saying this Lord does great things. What are the great things he's done? Well, he created the heavens. He spread out the earth. He divided the water from the land. He put the sky over the earth. He set the firmament, uh, basically the canopy that separates this creation from his heavenly dwelling, recalling that language from Psalm 1. He talks about how he sets the lights in the sky, uh, echoing that language back to Genesis 1, 14 through 17. The, the, the lights in the sky are the rulers of the day and the rulers of the night. So you have the sun, the moon, and the stars. And he's recalling that language here in the psalm as we find these great lights. As we find in verse 8, the sun to rule the day. Verse 9, the moon to rule the night. And so you see in that sense how there's sort of governors that the Lord has set in place. But the Lord has set these things in place. And so what this is recalling and intended to recall is we would think to the creation account. As they're thinking back and saying, now did God engage in some sort of drawn out battle? Uh, was there some sort of struggle going on there? And you say, no. Genesis tells us that the world came into being by the Lord simply commanding. As the Lord commands, we find that there is an action. There is a response that his word truly brings forth action. It brings out the consequence of his desires. So the psalmist is saying, ultimately, in terms of the greatness of God, who can rise above him? He is the one who set this creation in its place. He is the one who continues to rule over this creation. The understanding then of the sun and the moon and the stars is reminding us that, yes, the Lord ordered the days and the nights. The Lord is the one who continues to endure and to watch over this creation. And why is he doing this? He's doing this out of his steadfast love. And so in verses 1 through 9, the steadfast love of God is manifested in his rule, in his authority, in the essence of who he is. He's not only the God who has redeemed us and only the God who has acted on our behalf, but he is intimately tied to this creation. Uh, this is a product of his desire. It was not accidental. It was not through a struggle. It is God who is a great architect, the great designer, uh, the one who has called this creation into being. He didn't just remodel something. He made it from scratch. And he made it by his command. So right here, verses 1 through 9, we can say, well, there's enough proof here as to why we should worship this God. I'm sold. I need to be thankful to him. Look at this marvelous creation he made. He didn't create it in its fallen state. He created it in its glory and its beauty. He pronounced it good. But the psalm goes on in verses 10 through 22. It's not just he's a God over the creation, but as he makes this assertion that he's a Lord of Lords, now he's going on to show how he has manifested this reality. So it's not just some assertion, even though the assertion's appropriate, it's true. But he goes on to say, let's think about the history of this God. So we think about the firstborn in Egypt. What is that recalling for us? Well, it's recalling for us the Exodus event. This is where God finds his people. He finds his people in a place where they are in slavery. 
So the striking down the firstborn of Egypt, we may say, well, that, that doesn't sound very nice until you understand the context of this. This is just basically summarizing the ten plagues in this last plague. They have the Lord publishing several warnings to Pharaoh. Let my people go or more plagues are going to come. Let my people go or more plagues are going to come. And so finally we have the Lord striking down the firstborn of Egypt. And why? That's a redemptive event. Uh, he's bringing judgment to the nation of Egypt while he's delivering his people from their enslavement. The motivation of that again is his steadfast love. Because notice then as he goes on in verse 11, that he brings Israel out. It's not that Israel found their own way or nominated their own shepherd or figured out their own way to, to take up arms against Egypt. Not at all. It's the Lord who acted, the Lord who basically broke Pharaoh. The Lord is the one who comes with his people, brings them out of Egypt. And the Lord is the one who shows his deliverance. Again, his steadfast love endures forever. But it's not just that he overpowered Pharaoh. As he brings Israel out, he manifests his strong arm. He manifests a strong arm in several ways. We have the first one. We have Israel being pinned between the Red Sea and between the Egyptian army. And Israel is there panicking and wondering, how are we going to get out of this? Again, failing to understand the first nine verses of the psalm. God is the one who has separated the land and the sea. God is the one who has done this by his command. What does he do with Israel? He doesn't talk about Moses and raising his staff and anything that's happened there. He just talks about how the Lord divided the sea. Again, this is another creation act, if you will, recalling for us that division of the land and the sea, that the Lord splits the Red Sea in half, Israel passes through the midst of the sea on dry land, and they are those who are delivered. The Lord shows his mighty hand. That you have then Pharaoh and the mighty army, a superpower of the day, not only does he bring them out of Egypt after crushing Pharaoh, but now he literally conquers Pharaoh and the army by swallowing them in the sea. They are not delivered on the dry land, but they are those who are swallowed in what you would understand in that mindset of, of the abyss of death, that they're basically thrown into Hades, they're thrown into the belly of the sea, they're overwhelmed, they are conquered. The Lord is the one who is able to do this. But the Lord doesn't just deliver them out of Egypt. And it isn't that Israel is also in place in this wonderful pedestal and they've done this great thing. But he continues to lead Israel through the wilderness. So now he's moving to another uh, time in Israel's history where they've moved out of Egypt to now they're walking through the wilderness. So this is Israel going through the wilderness, wandering to the promised land, wondering, are we going to arrive? Is the Lord able to do this? But it's a psalm assuring us that, that these events were not arbitrary. The Lord shaping his people through this time. He led them. As he brought them out of Egypt, so he leads them through the wilderness. But we find that he strikes down great kings and mighty kings. And he recalls for us two kings. Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. Now these are many kings that he has done, but these are two kings that he calls to our attention. So again, he's called to our attention Pharaoh. We think of other kings and the conquest as Israel goes into the land of, of Canaan. And we wonder, at least I wondered, why, why does the Lord cite only these two kings? Why is he only talking about these skirmishes? It would seem it would make more sense. He led them through the wilderness. They went into the promised land. Joshua, or uh, he conquered mighty kings when they were in the land of Canaan. You think of the conquest of Joshua. But these two kings that he recalls are kings that they conquered in the wilderness. These are kings that, that give them a taste of victory, a taste of rest. Uh, Sion, uh, this we read about in Numbers 21, verse 21. Israel sends messengers to him, uh, and Israel asks that they would pass through the land. And they assure him that they're not going to take anything. They won't take from the water. They won't do anything uh, to harm them or to take anything from this land. 
But we know that as they are those who are to devote the Canaanites to destruction, this is what he hears, Sihon assembles his people, and we find that Israel then defeats him in what we have in a record of Numbers 21, verse 24. But then we also have the same uh, story that's recounted right after that, Numbers 21, 31. And this is where we have Og in the kingdom of Bashan, uh, who comes against them. Uh, the assurance the Lord gives to Moses is that uh, the Lord has given Bashan into their hand and they will prevail. But what's interesting about Numbers 21 is that this is not a victory passage for Israel. Now, towards the end, uh, when it recounts these kings that the Lord has overcome, uh, this certainly recounts and gives a taste and an assurance and sort of summarizes the conquest narratives. And so as it's summarizing Israel going into Canaan, it's saying, understand, the Lord did this. It was the Lord's doing. But Numbers 21 recounts failings of Israel, grumbling and, and rebellion against God. And so again, it's not Israel celebrating the goodness of God in the context of this. Now, the Lord delivers them. We have a story of the Lord saving them. But we don't find Israel in, in their uh, top game or their top place in, in how they present themselves before the Lord. And so what this communicates is exactly what this psalm repeats. The Lord doesn't do this because his people are worthy. The Lord doesn't do this because his people are strong. The Lord doesn't do this because the people are worthy of his love or his mercy. He does this because his steadfast love endures forever. And Numbers 21 certainly communicates that because there's nothing that Israel has done to show their worthiness of this deliverance. And yet we find that the Lord is the one who has done this. But ultimately then, notice where it goes in terms of the deliverance of Israel. That the Lord is the one who gave them their land. They had this heritage. Israel is the Lord's servant. That the Lord does accomplish his promise. And again, you think about handing over the land of Canaan to the people of Israel. Uh, did Abraham ever think he's going to own the land? Hebrews 11 talks about how Abraham put his focus and his goal in the heavenly land and looked beyond Canaan. And yet we, we think about Israel in terms of their exodus. Is Israel going to inherit a land as a people who are held captive by a pharaoh, by another mighty king? Is the Lord really able to deliver them? And then we find the story of the wilderness, and yes, and the Red Sea, and yes, and how there's kings that assemble before them in their weakest moment in terms of the wilderness, and yet they're victorious. And so the Lord is recalling for us, it's not about what they have done to make themselves worthy. The movement of God is a thing that is repeated throughout this psalm. The Lord's steadfast love endures forever. And the Lord manifests this in remembering his promises and carrying out his promises. This is manifested here in the history of Israel. But then we think about Israel and who we are and who we are as people and how the Lord is the one who cares and nurtures. And we look at verses basically 23 uh, through 25 where the Lord shows again who he is, that he remembered us. And so what, what's significant about that? Well, let's recount what the psalm's saying. This is a God who's created the world. Uh, he's not indifferent to the outcome of this world. This is his creation tied to him. He sustains it. Uh, he, he, he built it. He engineered it. He was the architect. He continues to uphold it. He is the one who delivers his people from slavery. He judges their enemies. And we find that it's the Lord who remembers his people. Notice that it's not that the people of Israel are worthy. You see, Numbers 21, going back to that, as Israel was to devote those cities to destruction, and how they were to go into the land of Canaan and establish this model of, of a heavenly kingdom on earth, that that was that unique time and that unique mandate for them. However, Israel is not in that place in the wilderness. They are dependent on God. And the Lord is the one who delivers them and raises them up and accomplishes the very victory of what God has set out for them to do. And so we have then in verse 23, 
He remembered us in our low estate. You see, the Lord could have walked away from Israel. Could have said, you know what? Those people got themselves enslaved. Pharaoh's kind of a big superpower. Don't know if I really want to mess with that. I'll just leave them in slavery and I'll find a new people. A people that are worthy of my affection. A people that are worthy of my love. But the phrase of the psalm is that God did not do that. Even though that's fully what we deserve. We do not deserve the Lord to show any love or mercy or benevolence or kindness to us. And that's why it emphasizes he remembered us in our lowest state. In other words, God was not this fair weather friend. Though life goes well, they're all around you and they're, they're rallying around you and they enjoy being around you. But boy, when things take a turn and you kind of fall backwards and, and you're not in, in, at the top of your game, then those friends kind of go away. The psalm is praising God because he came to his people at a very inconvenient time for God. This is not a time where it benefits God, but it benefits his people. And this is a praise of the psalm where it says, Praise be to God that when we were in a needy position, in a low position, in a humble state, we weren't beneficial to him. We were a drain on him. That this is when God came to us. It wasn't Israel coming to God. It was God coming to his people. The Lord leading his people through the Red Sea. He could have just left them for the Egyptian army. Said this is too much work. I don't want to deal with that sea. But the Lord leads them through it. The Lord could have said you know what. You people just rebel against me. You're a stiff necked people. I'm just going to leave you to die in the wilderness. But he doesn't do that. Two kings come against them, and he still delivers them in that time. So this praise of the Lord remembering his people in their lowest state is a time of, of humility for us and a time of celebration, of knowing that the Lord still loves his people. He does not turn his back on his people, that we do not deserve this mercy. But the Lord also, as he continues uh, to celebrate the goodness of God, that he rescues us from our foes. That the Lord is the one that as he looks upon us and the enemies come against us, he doesn't just leave us there. He's the one who brings about this ultimate deliverance. This is why there is thankfulness. This is why there is joy. But notice then that the goodness of God in the preservation of his creations. We can say, well, this just sort of sounds like a bunch of elitists uh, who are Abrahamites, who are tied to Abraham and just celebrating uh, this God who has done great things for them. Uh, but this God is only concerned for a small group of people. Notice verse 25. God doesn't just care for his people. But God gives food to all flesh. So it's an important thing to understand because if you read verses 1 through 9, the temptation may be from the psalm to say, see, God creates the world, he sets things in motion, he winds it up, and he lets it go. But verse 25 is telling us explicitly that's not how it goes. That when he gives his food to all flesh, I know that it goes beyond humanity. This is to all creatures, to this creation. He continues to preserve it, not only to those whom he has redeemed, but you think about this, he actually gives food and energy to those who will use their energy to conspire and rebel against God. He still sustains them in that. And so the psalm is praising God that he's, he's not some harsh being, as some may say. But all the things that are being recounted here, what was the joy? People are unworthy of his love, God comes to them. People who will never praise him, God still gives them food and gives them what they stand in need of. And what is the movement of that? His steadfast love endures forever. What a remarkable presentation of his love. Steadfast, doesn't change. This love is continually manifested and the endurance of it moving on forever is telling us that it moves beyond this age. It's a remarkable promise. 
Because it doesn't mean that God is some indifferent being. Where one day he may love us and have affection for us, and the next day he's, well, I don't know if I really love you anymore. And then he sends you away. But this love that endures forever is a love that's going to endure throughout this life. And it's going to transcend this life. That's the language here. That is actually God wants us to dwell with him in heaven. That's where he's bringing us. Because he loves us. And he wants us to dwell with him and to praise him. Obviously, it's not because he's lonely. It's not because he's needy. But it's because God desires to do this. For whatever reason, by his love, by his mercy, he desires to save a people unto himself. But then lastly, we look at verse 26, where it says, Give thanks to the God of heaven. That the psalm ends where it began. And so the very assertion at the beginning, where this psalm could have really ended at verse 1. The Psalm 136 could be, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 137. That is enough for us to contemplate the goodness of God. We say, yes, his steadfast love endures forever. Let's think about steadfast love. Let's, let's think about that concept. What does it mean that the steadfast love endures forever? Let's think about that concept. And then we could think about that and go through the scriptures. But by the time we get to verse 26, here he's saying again, do you understand why you give thanks to God? For this is a God of heaven. So now he's not just identifying him as against other beings that have tried to make war, other kings or other uh, competitive gods that we have derived in our own minds. But he's saying there is one God. And he's saying there's one God that we need to give thanks to and honor. This is the God who dwells in heaven. So when you think back to that creation account, when the Lord fixes the canopy or the firmament, basically uh, making this world, you can see Genesis 1 almost presenting this world as a terrarium, that God has basically encapsulated it, and, and the Lord has set the boundaries for it, if you will. And then the Lord is the one who goes and dwells in his holy place, but yet he still cares for this creation, watches over this creation, even as he's seated in the glory of heaven. That this is what the psalm wants us to think about and contemplate in terms of the goodness of God. When we think about the God of heaven, and we think about the God of his steadfast love, who continues to manifest his care, that this ties us into even what we've been studying in terms of the Trinity from the Belgic Confession. Because what has God done? Well, it's the Father who has called the people. The father has called Abraham. He said to Abraham, I'm going to call the people. I'm going to raise them up as a mighty nation. And I'm going to hand them over to slavery for a number of years, for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out by a mighty hand. This recalls for us, the father who made this promise has brought this promise about. That's what Psalm 136 is celebrating. When we think about the promise of, of the spirit dwelling in the midst of his people, how do we come to know that the Lord's steadfast love endures forever? Well, hopefully as we read this psalm, we think about these words, we contemplate these promises, and we think, yes, this is true, amen. This is why I need to be thankful to my God. This is who he is, and, and I need to be aligned with his purpose. Well, what's doing that? It's not because we're so wise in and of ourselves. How does the Lord find his people? Not in a place where it's convenient for him, but in our lowly estate, as the people who are broken, as the people who need his love and need his mercy. But most of all, we think about these proofs that are offered in the psalm and how the Lord has walked with his people. Who is the one who ultimately meets us in a humble estate? We think about Christ entering into history. And why does Christ enter into history? Well, to definitively defang any of the kings or the serpent or any of those who would dare to conspire with the serpent to rise above the great God of heaven. But as Christ enters history to walk this earth, what is that? It's a manifestation of God's steadfast love that endures forever. 
When Christ goes to the cross, what is he doing? Well, he's enduring that Red Sea crossing, uh, passing into the very pit of death. But unlike the Egyptians who wash up on the shore uh, the following day, we have Christ doesn't wash up on the shore, but he actually walks out of the tomb of death as a triumphant savior because the Lord's steadfast love endures forever. That this psalm is something we can very much take upon our own lips. When we doubt the goodness of God, the mercy of God, his care for us, we read again and again how the psalmist writes and communicates. See how the Lord has made this creation. See how the Lord has cared for his people. See how the Lord has cared for all flesh. See how the Lord has cared for you as one of his redeemed who have been made alive and set apart in Christ. And so in conclusion then, Psalm 136 is not just giving us a command to be thankful. And yes, it is. It begins in verse 1, verse 26, with the command, give thanks to God. But that's not all it's doing. It's telling us why this command has validity. Not that God has to prove himself, but we find a manifestation of God's steadfast love in this, that he takes the time to actually say, let's contemplate who I am. Let's contemplate who you are. And let's contemplate what I have done to make you my people and to lead you and guide you and to sustain you. It's very much a celebration of the Lord's mercy and grace that he has bestowed upon his people. This then becomes that psalm of thanksgiving, that we are thankful to God for who he is, thankful to God that he has redeemed, thankful to God that he has acted, Thankful to God that as he makes a promise to Abram to be a shield and defender in Genesis 15, that here he's furnishing proof of that reality. He's saying, see, I have been your shield and defender throughout the history of God's uh, redemption, of God's care, and of God's provision. And so when we celebrate this steadfast love, what, what does that fundamentally mean? It means we celebrate the reality that God's love does not change. It's not indifferent. It's not warm. It's not cold. God bestows his love upon his people. The steadfast love is manifested not only on his people, but even on this creation. Even on those that will never love him or come to him, that we find that he still cares for them. But ultimately, with his steadfast love that endures forever, it's the assurance of knowing that as he confers and bestows his love upon us, that we will pass from this age to the life to come. Not as Pharaoh, as those who use his steadfast love and his long-suffering nature to take advantage of him, but as those who will enter into his rest and glory and celebration, that it's the same God that is, as he has brought Israel into Canaan in that unlikely event, as the same God who will bring us into heaven because of his steadfast love. Let us then not be a people who think that we are worthy of this love, or worthy of this mercy, or worthy of this grace. Let us not push the boundaries of this grace. But let us truly desire to live for the glory and honor of our God as he has bestowed his steadfast love upon us in our times of doubt. Let us think about the goodness of his care and his provision, and our times when we're feeling proud. Let us remember how God found us, not in a time of victory, in a time of lowly estate. And what has the Lord done? He has brought his people from a low place and continued to lead them and ultimately brings them to the highest place, to the heavenly city of Jerusalem. Let us then take this life in light of that wonderful redemptive promise that the Lord manifests here because the steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. 
please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.